What's happening guys, welcome to another episode. If you guys saw the previous video where I showed you how to install a cooler work short shifter in your car, you're exactly where you need to be because right now I'm gonna be showing you how to install some upgraded engine mounts, transmission mounts, and rear subframe mounts. So on my Nissan 370Z, it comes with obviously stock bushings and mounts. Now those mounts and everything are only designed for street use. As soon as you push the car to beyond those limits, you'll find that those are weak points of the car. So after I've done a couple mods to my Z, including a tune, it feels like my throttle response is very soft and that's because the engine shifts, the transmission shifts, the subframe shifts, and the differential, but I'll get into that in a later video. But in the meantime, I have these three parts over here that are gonna increase the NVH slightly, the noise, vibration, and harshness, but more importantly, it's going to increase the car's stability. The on and off throttle load is going to be a lot smaller and it's just gonna make the car drive a hell of a lot nicer. Let's get into the install. So for the mods today, we're gonna to start off with working at the front of the vehicle and we're gonna work our way backwards. So starting at the front, we're gonna find the motor mounts. Now these here not only support the weight of the vehicle, but it reduces the amount of load from left to right when you get on and off the throttle. It makes it so that the engine itself isn't directly bolted to the chassis and you don't feel every single vibration. Now these mounts here are made from billet aluminum and 70 durometer polyurethane. These are from Z1 Motorsports and these are a very nice high quality unit. These are not only two pounds lighter than the stock mounts, but these are rebuildable and these will have much better driver feel. Moving down, we also have another part from Z1 Motorsports. This is very similar to the engine mount where it's billet aluminum and 70 durometer polyurethane. This is going to be a very easy install. There's only a couple bolts holding it in and this is going to secure the transmission up to the body of the car a lot nicer. Moving down, once more, we're gonna be working with another part from Z1. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, is this video sponsored by Z1? No, it's not. I wish it was, but all these parts are honestly very good, and these here are inserts that install themselves into the subframe of the rear of the car. Now, this is going to basically fill in any voids and any gaps that are found with the rubber bushings, and it's gonna basically fill it in for something that isn't going to have any flex. So short from replacing the bushings in the subframe with something fully stiff, like literally billet aluminum, we're gonna have some aluminum and a little bit of the OEM rubber in there. So let's get started with the engine mounts. So guys, when it comes around to actually installing your motor mounts, if you guys can, try and plan it around at the same time you're gonna be doing other work to your car in that area, like changing out headers or exhaust manifolds or something like that. Because if you can take the manifold out, it will give you so much more room to get other work done. So I'm gonna get started with taking the old mounts out because I have the exhaust already out. If you guys don't take it out, it'll make your life a lot easier. So if you look on the passenger side or the driver's side, the orientation is all gonna be the same, but you'll be able to see the motor mount found up front once you have the exhaust manifold removed. So this top nut right here is a 14 millimeter, and the one on the bottom side is a 17 millimeter. So I'm gonna be tackling both of those bolts in two different ways, let me show you how. So using this universal, this 14 millimeter socket, this long extension, and my impact gun, I'm gonna slide this down in here, slide it over top of the stud, for the upper portion for the mount and zap it off. So there's the upper one, the lower one is even easier. Using the same impact gun, a smaller extension and a 17 mil half inch socket, we're gonna go underneath the car and we're gonna remove the lower bolt for the motor mount. So now looking from the underside of the car, if you locate the front lower control arm, just to the side of it, you'll find the opening with the 17 millimeter lower engine mount nut. Using an impact gun or regular hand tools, remove the nut completely. Keep track of it since we'll need it to install the new mounts. You can repeat the same thing for the driver side engine mount. With that complete, we need to support the weight of the engine and then raise it so that we can pull the engine mounts from their holes in the subframe and the engine brackets. Notice that I'm using a piece of wood to help distribute the weight of the engine over a larger area. That way it will prevent the oil pan from deforming. As you continue to pump the jack, you'll notice the gap between the engine bracket and the engine mounts getting larger. Keep jacking up the car until you have enough space, but be careful not to damage any wires between the transmission and the bell housing of the body as you're raising it up. Due to how long each of the studs are for the engine mounts, the engine really has to be raised, probably about two to three inches. After you've wrestled it out of place from the top, leave it in the engine bay. Then, crawl underneath the car and remove it from there, since there won't be enough space to pull it from up in the engine bay, even with your intakes removed. This here is what the engine mount looks like. Thick, heavy, rubber, no bueno. This here is our upgrade. Thin, light, polyurethane, much better. 
So with the new mount and both nuts that were fastening the old mount, you can actually set the mount into place from up top, since it's going to be a smaller profile. You can see here that it fits between the cylinder head and the frame of the car. Now I found it easiest to rest the engine mount on top of the subframe with the top of the threads protruding through the engine mount bracket. It allowed me to thread the nut onto the threads. Following that, I lowered the engine until the weight of the engine was off the jack, and then the lower threads of the studs fell through into the subframe. That allowed me to slightly thread the lower nut onto the mount, that way the engine is technically secured to the passenger side. The reason why I did that is so that with the driver side mounting hardware removed and the jack raising the engine, the engine will slightly rotate counterclockwise, which will give me more room to remove the engine mount without lifting the engine very high. Then instead of removing the engine mount from the back side of the subframe like we did on the passenger side, I pulled it from the front since the steering column was in the way, but I had to first move this wire. You have to snake it towards the front of the car and then around the sway bar. With the engine mount removed, we can swap it with our upgraded one. Z1 recommends applying blue thread locker onto both the upper and lower threads of the mount to ensure that any engine vibrations won't rattle the nuts off of the stud. With it applied and sitting in the engine bay, you can lower the engine so the weight is now off the jack. Now on the driver's side, there's this little bracket. Don't forget to mount it on top prior to fastening the hardware. The lower nut, you're gonna to wanna to torque to 68 foot-pounds. And then following that, the upper nut is gonna to be torqued to 36 foot-pounds. So that there will complete the install for the aftermarket Z1 polyurethane motor mounts. So at this point, you can take the jack out from underneath the engine, it'll stop supporting that, because we're gonna need this for the next install. So moving down the drive line, we're gonna install the Z1 polyurethane transmission mount. Now this mount is gonna be very easy to install. This is by far the easiest of the three mounts or bushings or whatever that we're gonna be replacing today. This is super easy. Let me show you how to get this done. So first things first, we're gonna get our jack, bring it to the middle of the car. So found underneath the car, we'll be able to see that we have the transmission right here along with this cross member. Now above this cross member is where the transmission mount is located. So there's only going to be four bolts found on the perimeter of the transmission cross member that we need to take off along with those two bolts or nuts that are attached in the center of it. So we first need to support the weight of the transmission so that we can unbolt those bolts. So looking at the back side of the transmission, we'll be able to see that we have the transmission fill bolt and the drain bolt found right there. So I'm gonna be supporting the transmission right behind it so that the weight of the transmission is going to be on the jack instead of this cross member. So with the jack, you just need it to support the transmission. You're not trying to push it through the body of the car. I'm using my brushless impact gun to fully remove all four of the cross member bolts. Looking upwards, you can see that there are two additional nuts that are holding the cross member onto the mount. Because there's a stud going through the nut, you'll need a deep socket to remove it. All of these bolts have 14 millimeter heads, so in theory, you can use the same impact gun and the same deep 14 mil socket. With them both removed, you can set the cross member aside and will expose the transmission mount. Take a look at how soft this bushing is, and this is on a car that only has 40,000 kilometers on it. It's crazy. You should be able to see the two bolts that secure the mount up to the bottom side of the transmission. Zap them out, also using your impact gun. With the mount removed and out of the car, you can see how much the stock rubber flexes. And when we compare it to the aftermarket one, you can see it doesn't budge. Since the 70 durometer poly mount isn't solid aluminum, it will absorb some of the vibrations and allow for a little bit of deflection, while still performing much better than the factory rubber mounts. Getting back under the car with the mount facing forward, thread the bolts through the mount and into the transmission, and then torque them to the manufacturer's spec. You can follow it up by reinstalling the cross member and tightening it up to the upgraded mount with the two nuts. You won't be able to torque them until you have the cross member secured to the body. So with the four original bolts, thread them into the body just so that the cross member doesn't move when we torque the mount nuts. All of these bolts and nuts are torqued to the same spec, which is 36 foot pounds. So ensure that you go over every bolt and make sure they're all properly tightened. You can then lower the jack and remove it from underneath the car. So with the OEM mount out and the new one in, the transmission and engine are going to be moving a lot less. So these polyurethane mounts are gonna be able to withstand more torque, higher pressures, and more abuse than the stock rubber stuff. Now, they also won't degrade to the same extent as the rubber ones will either. Now, the cool thing about these mounts too is that you can replace the polyurethane inserts without buying entirely new motor mounts. So if you ever need to rebuild them, it's cheap. 
So one really cool thing too is that with this engine and transmission mount setup, if you guys have an aftermarket shifter, like this Cooler Works one here, you guys are gonna have it so that the shifter itself isn't going to be moving. When you guys ever do a burnout or anything like that, the engine isn't going to be loading and unloading and moving a lot, which means the shifter itself isn't going to be like literally moving inside the car. If you've ever done a burnout, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Now moving on to the next part, we're gonna be installing the Z1 subframe collars. Now these things are billet aluminum pieces that fit into the rubber bushings. Now you can replace the bushings themselves with different ones like polyurethane or even solid aluminum, but you have to drop the entire subframe and it's a good amount of work. I'm gonna get into that probably later when I do some more work in the rear end for maybe the differential, but in the meantime, these subframe collars shouldn't in theory take that long and the subframe itself doesn't need to be dropped for you to install these. Depending on which platform you have, you will have different lettered subframe colors. So these here are designed for a G37 or 370Z, and you'll notice I have B, C, and E. So these colors will go in certain spots in the car so that they reduce the amount of flexing in the actual subframe. So working from the frontmost portion of the car, so the rear subframe, the front bolts, this collar here is going to be inserted into it. Moving backwards, we're going to have this upper one here, C. That is going to be for the rear bolts of the rear subframe. And this one here, B, is going to be on the bottom side of the rear subframe. So this is going to come up, and this one here is gonna go on top. So you can see that there's like little grooves on the insides of them, and these are gonna have to be clocked in a certain direction so that they slide into the subframe and they sit flush. That's pretty much what we're looking for. You might be able to install these collars without removing all the parts that I am. However, I'm showing you guys worst case scenario. To allow the subframe to be lowered enough so that you can slide the inserts between the subframe and the body without actually dropping the subframe, all the chassis bracing needs to come off. The rear V-shaped brace has six bolts holding it into place. Two found at the rear, two found on the driver's side, and then another two on the passenger side. They all have 14 mil heads, so you won't need to change out sockets while taking this off. What I didn't realize is that with my axle back section of my exhaust still installed on the car, it won't give me enough space to remove the brace, so it's gotta come out. With the rear section of the exhaust removed, it will give me ample space to drop and remove the V-brace. Moving closer to the front of the car, there's an additional W-shaped brace that also has to come off. The braces look like this and they're all held in place by 14 mil bolts. I'm gonna be cleaning them up and then spraying them with fluid film to prevent them from rusting before putting them back onto the car. With the rear section of the cap back and the two braces removed from the car, the only bolts that are securing the rear subframe up to the body are going to be the one on each side found back here on the rear section of the subframe the one found up here on the front section of the subframe, and then this lower brace over here that is connected by those two bolts and this center nut. So this nut here shares this bracing piece and the subframe. So you're gonna be using a 19 millimeter socket for both the front and the rear bolts to take them all out. So with them like this, they're very easily accessible. Just get an impact, loosen up the nut a little bit just so that it's basically to the bottom side of here. We're gonna lower it on all fours so the subframe lowers down and then basically start working on one side at a time. To disconnect this front brace attached to the rear subframe, just zap off these two bolts. Then switching to my larger impact gun with a larger 19 millimeter socket, we can lower the subframe. So each of the four nuts that are securing the subframe up to the body, we just have to loosen them. Considering how long each of the studs are, we can install these inserts without fully removing the subframe. I'm loosening them up just a bit at a time, so the subframe lowers relatively square. I wouldn't suggest going full send on one side and then full send on the other. Now when you get around to lowering the rear section of the subframe, the extra rear brace might need to come out. It's just held in place by a couple other bolts, they're 14 mils. By the way, if you do decide to fully remove the rear nuts, which is also securing in this rear brace, you should support the weight of the subframe with a jack. Beginning with the rear of the subframe, slide the billet collar that's labeled C on top of the rear bushing. I have the opening facing towards the outside of the car. Next up comes working with collar B. Spray some silicone lubricant into the lower portion of the bushing to allow the collar to slide into place easier. It's going to be a tight fit, so feel free to give it a couple good taps with a rubber mallet. It doesn't need to fully seat itself since it will be pressed into place when we re-secure the subframe to the chassis. Next up, the collar E needs to be installed at the front of the rear subframe. 
Now I would say this is definitely a tighter space, but it is doable. If you want more room and light, feel free to remove the rear wheels before installing this mount. With the collar dropped into place and fully seated into the bushing, we can begin the reassembly. We'll be reusing all the OEM nuts and bolts that were initially removed, so begin by grabbing the rear subframe brace and the two 19mm nuts. Then start tightening the front and rear subframe nuts incrementally so the subframe rises back into position. You'll be able to lower the jack and remove it from underneath the car. Follow it up by torquing each of the 19mm subframe nuts to 81 foot-pounds. It's very important that they're properly secured into place, so be sure that you're using a proper torque wrench and don't just go full send with an impact gun. It's the same spec for the front and rear nuts, so tighten those nuts until you hear a click. All of the smaller 14mm head subframe brace bolts are to be tightened to 24 foot-pounds. The smaller brace, like the W brace, the V brace, and the front subframe brace, they're all 24 foot-pounds. So set it once and go over every one of these 12 bolts. So guys, that there will pretty much complete the install. I just need to bolt up the rest of the exhaust system back on the car, and then we can go and take this thing out for a rip. Alrighty guys, so it's been about two weeks since I've installed the mounts on the car, and I gotta say, it makes an insane difference going from stock to everything here. Now, all of this is after having an EQ Tech upgraded tune on the car, which remaps the throttle map so you have better throttle response. Now, the issue is, is that you still have soft engine mounts, soft transmission mounts, soft subframe mounts, and differential mounts. Now, that means that anytime that you go from either on-load to off-load, you have to wait for all of those mounts to torque up before the car actually gets going. So. With these mounts, that's not the case. It's almost entirely solved. So I still have the rubber bushing inside the subframe with the, now the aluminum that's filling in those voids. And I also have the rubber bushing that's found for the differential, but it makes a big difference. So let me show you how little the subframe moves and how much the differential moves. So the differential still needs to be upgraded. That's gonna be for a future video, but check this out. to onload and offload, you can literally see the differential moving, not only at the backside, but also at the front. And there's three bushings that are holding that diff into place, and it's still moving that much. I can only imagine what that's like on an older car, or even a car that's been tracked a good amount. Now typically when you go to an upgraded polyurethane or subframe engine mount and transmission mount, usually the car feels like a race car. It's not exactly the most livable thing to deal with in the world. Um, I didn't notice any cons to any of these mounts. There's no harshness, there's no vibrations through the cabin, the dash itself doesn't rattle the shit. So like it's still a dailyable solution that I think feels very good. If you ask me, this is how the car should have come off the manufacturer floor but it didn't. So, what do I say to you guys? If you guys can, finish this video, wrap it up, go on Z1's website, go buy these parts, and you guys are gonna have a much better feeling Z. Doesn't matter if it's a base model, a Nismo, a new Z, or a mild out Z. You're going to appreciate these mounts, I promise you. Now, something else to note is that when I installed these mounts on the car, the NVH didn't go up. However, the wheel hop did go down. Wheel hop is something that you'll experience if you guys have a rear wheel drive car, even front wheel drive car, with very compliant bushings. So if you push it or you have ever spin the tires out, the bushings themselves will load and unload with the wheel spinning. And what that does is the entire rear end, if it's a rear wheel drive car, or front end for a front wheel drive car, will feel like it's hopping. You'll be able to feel it in the pedals and in the steering wheel. It's not exactly the most comfortable thing in the world. If you guys keep pushing it with the wheel hopping, that's where you can actually snap axles and control arms. Not a fun time. Um, after I drove this car for a good 100 kilometers, I brought it home and I retorqued the rear subframe. So the rear subframe not only did not use Loctite, but I think that the colors themselves seated more into the bushing and I needed to retorque those for it to be properly tight because it was kind of loose. But with that being said, guys, I would 100% recommend this. I wish I bought these things sooner. It's one of those mods that you'll appreciate whether it's a stock car or full-blown track car. If you guys have any further questions regarding the video, comment sections down there. You guys know what to do. Thanks for watching.
I'll see you in the next one. For you guys that stayed to the end, next video is an exhaust video. Woo!